Thank you. In preparing for this uh, talk, I've been on a journey back throughout my life, almost to its beginning. And as any of you who would have looked back over your own lives will know, that is an emotional journey in many respects. Uh, apologies while I just get my props out here. They're not, they're not being cooperative. So. Now, on this, the screen, before you, you'll see a map of portion of the world. And that red dot that you see there is actually the Emerald Isle, the island of Ireland, from which I emanate. And it has a population of approximately six and a half million people. Now, when people talk about Ireland, they talk about a modern country, a friendly and welcoming place, the 40 shades of green in our countryside, St. Patrick's Day, the shamrock, rain, of which we get lots. Our national drink, Guinness, the black stuff. And of course, we love crack. And for those of you who don't know what crack is, crack is actually the Irish language word for fun. So Ireland in the 1950s was a completely different country. A country of high immigration, high unemployment, a disastrous economy, one in which more money was coming back into our country from our immigrants abroad than the GDP of our country. Ours was a very uh, insular, self-conscious, and claustrophobic country, soci soci seriously socially controlled through church and state. Now, I was born, or sorry, social control is, social control is important for the orderly functioning of our society. And social control effectively governs how we lead our daily lives. But social control can be used in a very negative fashion, which has serious implications for individuals and society in general. Indeed, women in Ireland in times past were particularly socially controlled, and we had other negative social controls around unmarried mothers, orphanages, and industrial schools. I was born in the second half of the 1950s. I was the first of four children in our family of three boys and one girl. My, ours was a loving family where my parents did everything they could to ensure that we had a happy childhood. Indeed, as was the social control at the time, my mother was at home to raise us children because women in Ireland could not work once they married. I first went to school I'm the cute guy there in the front row, a third from the right. I, I, first, I first went to school in 1960 at the age of four, which was the normal age for first attendance at school. This was an exciting time for me as I walked to school with older children from my neighborhood. My parents, especially my mother, would have provided me with a lot of the basic knowledge to prepare me for school. But nothing could have prepared me for that very first day. Now, schools in Ireland at the time were very rigid in terms of curriculum and teaching methods. And my enthusiasm quickly diminished the very my, on my very first day. Now, a question for you, the audience. How many people here are left-handed? You might raise your hands, please. Okay. Congratulations. In addition to myself, you are one of the group of people in the world who are left-handed. Only about 10% of the population is so gifted. Being right handed in, Gael, or in, in, the Gael, in, in Gaelic, the Irish language, we are known as a kitog, a left handed person. Being right handed does not have the same connotations in Gaelic. Now, another question for you Have any of you left handed ever had negative experiences because of your left handedness? I don't see any hands raised. Okay, but well, that's good. So you, you can imagine my horror when first I picked a pen, pencil to write or a crayon to color. And the teacher of my class tried to get me to change the hand I used for writing or coloring to my right hand. 
At first she used verbal means to encourage me to change, but when that didn't work, she took a ruler, beat me across the left hand, and she continued to administer this form of physical corporal punishment on an ongoing basis throughout my first weeks at school. It still hurts. I have vivid memories of those early days at school and can clearly remember crying my heart out because I could not understand what was happening to me. Um, my, this, this abuse continued until my father came to the school uh, to sort out the situation. As it happened, the day he arrived at the school, I was sitting outside my, the door of my classroom where I had been placed by my teacher because of my stubborn non-compliance with her efforts to change me. I was sitting facing another group of older boys and girls who stared at me because I had identified as a recalcitrant child, basically a bold boy. Thankfully, my father's visit to school finished the efforts of that teacher to change my natural left-handed ways. But unfortunately, the damage had been done. Corporal punishment continued to be a feature of my schooling right throughout my education up to 1974 when I finished. And corporal punishment was the norm in Irish schools up to 1982 when it was outlawed. Now, the control around my left hand and corporal punishment were the two negative forms of social control which impacted me directly and had consequences for me for many, many years to come. When I first attended school at the tender age of four, I was a quiet, sensitive child. But because of my experiences regarding control of my left hand punishment, I became extremely shy, retiring, and fearful, avoiding at all costs anything which would draw attention to myself in class. I did not feel comfortable engaging in classroom discussion for fear of failure, ridicule, or being wrong and suffering the punishment. Unfortunately, I developed a deep dislike for school. Now, on the screen before you, you'll see the impacts of abuse of left-handed people who were forced to change their writing hand to their right hand. And the next slide comes from the Global Initiative to End All Corporal Punishment and it lists the consequences of corporal punishment. Both these slides make disturbing reading. So how does one deal with this type of treatment or abuse? Well, as a four-year-old, it is extremely difficult to understand. And it's extremely difficult to understand Fear becomes uh, an overriding factor and places serious obstacles in your path. This can be paralyzing. As with many shy children, I, I developed a, a mask and acted as if nothing was affecting me, even though internally I may have been filled with fear. You tend to internalize everything You tend to internalize everything. Yep. So these, these became my supports for many, many years. Sport became extremely important to me. And because it gave me a, it and a means of expressing myself. Because I was good at both soccer and rugby, I was popular. But that did not take away the shyness or the fear. My stubbornness I retained in a positive way, making me determined, and I became resilient and self-reliant. I developed a deep sense of the injustice that exists in the world, and I became empathetic. And in later life, I took an active interest in human rights issues. Thankfully, I did not lose my interest in learning, 
And reading became a means of learning for me. Not only learning, but also a means of escaping to exotic places and adventures. As a 12-year-old, I remember reading about Marco Polo and his journey along the Silk Road. It is interesting that it is nearly 60 years since I first experienced that abuse regarding my left hand and corporal punishment. The world, in many ways, has changed dramatically in that time. Unf unfortunately, even though the abuse regarding the control of the left hand has generally disappeared in the developed world, there are still a considerable number of countries in this world where it is practiced. And sadly, corporal punishment of children still continues to be a problem around the world, both at home and school. Thankfully, Ireland has moved on from the dark days of the 1950s. But it involved considerable efforts by individuals and support groups before the wrongs of the past were acknowledged. It is important that we question continuously society, forms of government, and controls. It doesn't mean that we have to put ourselves in the limelight to do so, but we can sign petitions, support charities, and support other groups who actively work to promote change. And no child should have to suffer abuse in any shape or form. It is said that in this world, it is often our most innocent and vulnerable who suffer. Unfortunately, early experiences of abuse lasted with me right up into my 30s. And it even affected my working life. Throughout my life, I have been somewhat unconventional. And I believe this helped me to eventually overcome my, uh, my early ex experiences of abuse. Being resilient and self-reliant were also beneficial factors, in addition to becoming inventive and innovative. During my teenage years, I grew my hair long, wore amazingly bright clothes, and eventually grew a substantial beard. When I finished school, university, but in my 30s, I studied and obtained diplomas in professional computing and social studies. I worked for 40 years in local government in Ireland. And in my early days, I worked in a, at a public counter where people would often comment that I was a kitog. It was only in my mid-30s that I started to overcome my shyness and uh, my shyness and uh, explore my own abilities. I started to push myself into situations which required me to deal with the shy part of my character. At that time, Tai Chi became part of my life. Tai Chi is an ancient form of passive Chinese martial art. It creates a harmony of mind, body, and spirit through relaxed movements with a relaxed mind and body. Luckily, I had developed a positive approach to life, and I am always the eternal optimist. Being able to adapt was also very helpful to me. It was only in my 30s that my career in local government started to progress 20 years after I first entered the service because my shyness had impacted negatively upon me in interview situations. In my late 30s, unfortunately, my hair started to desert me. And my long hair became a ponytail, which at one stage reached down to my butt. This provided lots of food for conversation and gossip at the coffee. But I retained my ponytail right up to the end of my career. And I believe that I have the unique distinction of being the only county secretary in the almost 100-year history of Irish local government who had a ponytail. Now, 
The, the greatest uh, and most disturbing challenge was still waiting uh, to ambush me. Almost six years uh, to the day, this next Monday in fact, my first wife Margaret passed from this life. We'd been married for almost 33 years. Get a grip here, Jim. And we have two wonderful children. It all happened in a very short space of time, three weeks to be, uh, three weeks to be exact. I had already started talking about retirement because I always said that I would retire at 60. The last three years of my working life were extremely busy. And my personal life was traumatic due to the loss of loved ones, wider family, and friends. But I still thought about retirement. And to quote my wife, Margaret, we cannot go back. We can only go forward. People in Ireland, when they think about retirement, they think about putting their feet up, relaxing, reading books, doing a small bit of gardening, and going on sun holidays. In early August, in early August 2014, I was reading a book on the Silk Road, and I remembered over 40 years previously reading about Marco Polo and his journey along the Silk Road. I wondered if anyone traveled the Silk Road anymore. When I checked on the internet, I discovered that there were a number of companies offering trips overland along the Silk Road. In order for me to take one of these trips, it would be necessary for me to retire. So having discussed the idea with my daughter over a period of weeks, I booked my trip almost 12 months before it was due to commence. This then gave me a date for my retirement. So off I went in August 2015 to journey along the Silk Road. I was excited at the prospect of 13 weeks adventure, traveling overland to many exotic places, discovering different cultures and peoples. Along the way, I met Kelly Craft, the librarian here at Tassock. So the romance of the Silk Road became romance on the Silk Road. We fell in love and married last year. I am firmly convinced that if I had taken the conventional retirement route, I would still be living a single lonely life back in Limerick. So life is good and there is always hope. At my retirement function, people asked me, what are you going to do with your life? I said, I'm going to live and discover the beauty of life. Life is for living and to quote a fellow countryman of mine, Oscar Wilde, to live is the rarest gift in the world. Most men exist, that is all. And from the Lebanese philosopher, poet, and artist, Khalil Gibran, we live only to discover beauty. All else is a form of waiting. So I've spent the last three years living life, traveling, trekking, and discovering the beauty in the world. The unconventional has brought me to Kinshasa. S to some here on the campus, I am known as the bandana man. To young children on the campus, I am known as the pirate. But at heart, I am still that sensitive child who started out over 60 years ago and overcame the obstacles and challenges life faced in his way through resilience, self-reliance, having a positive approach to life, being inventive, adaptive, and unconventional. Thank you.